Hey, look at that. Everybody, good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome once again to the second session of the 2021 through 22 Milwaukee Leadership Academy. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw our slideshow up on the screen and we can get started with that. Uh, let me go ahead and share at this time. Hey, there it is. All righty. And let me present this. Ah, da, da, da. Present from beginning, and we're going to swap them. Hey, look at that! We're seeing now the big, the big show, right? The big screen. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 All right. Like I said, courtesy recording notice. This is being recorded. Please don't make your own recordings of it. If you'd like to turn off your camera so that you are not being recorded, that is a okay with us. Uh, tonight, in this second session, we're going to talk about history and records, and also from uh, Greg Hemer and I hope a little bit from Stefan, we're going to hear about uh, uh, ways to be involved in the community and ways that they have been involved in the community, uh, some of the stuff that's available out there. Um, we do have two guests with us tonight who I neglected to put up uh, pictures for, and that is our very own city recorder, Mr. Scott Stauffer, uh, and uh, hear from many, many, many uh, different parts of our community, but tonight, most notably from the Milwaukee Museum, Mr. Greg Hemer, uh, and they will be presenting for us here in a few minutes. Uh, I do want to start with the schedule. We're going to start with a little bit of housekeeping, uh, and then we're going to get into Milwaukee history. Around seven o'clock, we're going to pause for a brief break, uh, and then we'll continue on that and get into the city recorders session. Uh, and then also we'll talk about some uh, aha moments as usual. So be be on the lookout for those. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, we do have some events coming up this Saturday uh, at 11 a.m. We're going to be, the city is going to be holding an event to celebrate the new uh, multi-use path on Linwood. This is uh, mostly going to be for pedestrians and bicyclists. So for folks who are interested in coming down and taking a look at that, we're not widely advertising it, but it's happening. So come on down. Uh, city offices are going to be closed next Thursday and Friday for the Thanksgiving holiday. We have coming up the Umbrella Parade and Tree Lighting. That's going to be on December 4th at 3.30, beginning at 3.30 in the South Downtown Plaza. Um, for those of you who are new to Milwaukee, and I know that we have a number of new residents uh, in class, this is pretty cool. As far as I know, the Umbrella Parade is the only one of its kind in the United States. This is a purely Milwaukee tradition, uh, although certainly some of our community historians who are here with us tonight might be able to shed a brighter light on that. Uh, the parade begins at the South Downtown Plaza, which is on Main Street down near the uh, post office. Like I said, at 3.30, there are going to be three categories of competition, and those are going to be, gosh, I'm going to misquote this right now, most Milwaukee, most festive, and most creative. So if you would like to decorate an umbrella and come down and compete, you're welcome to do that. If you'd like to decorate an umbrella and just come down and walk in the parade, come on and do that too. This is an event that's open to the entire family, uh, so uh, kids and people of all ages are welcome to come on out. We do encourage everybody who comes to any of these events to uh, keep COVID safety protocols in mind, wear your masks, keep your distance, and for those of you who haven't got your shot, no time like the present. Uh, the Milwaukee Parks Foundation is going to be holding a series of fundraisers throughout uh, throughout December. So for folks who would like to come down and see the Christmas ships, uh, those nights, and there's there's more information that's available about that uh, through the Milwaukee Parks Foundation website, certainly through their Facebook page, and then it's going to be listed in this month's pilot as well. Folks who would like to come down on the same nights as the Christmas ships and shop at uh, certain participating downtown restaurants, I believe, uh, uh, we'll be able to help raise funds for the Milwaukee Parks Foundation that way. Our January class, we're looking at moving to January 12th. And the reason for that is because uh, that's going to be hopefully our public works class. And if that does happen, then we can expect to hear about public works, parks, and the city's climate action plan. The problem or the trouble there is that on the third and fourth Wednesdays of each month, our public works uh, folks have the tree board and also the park and recreation board. Singular there, Scott. I got you on that one. Uh, and so that's a, that's a conflicting meeting. But we really do want to hear from Peter Passarelli uh, and Natalie Rogers from Public Works. So hopefully we'll have them out. Uh, 
other than that, are there any other community updates? Does anybody have um, uh, community meetings that are coming up, uh, community events, anything that they would like to announce uh, here? Uh, this is Charles. We've got an Ivy pool on Elkrock Island tomorrow, Saturday at nine o'clock. Come, come dress for the weather and um, something to protect your hands and your everything from thorns and whatever you might run into and come on out and have a little fun, nine to noon. Great event. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ivy Pole, and I believe that's uh, in in uh, coordination with NCPRD, isn't it? Yes, it is. All right, Thank you, you for go. adding that. Yes. Yeah. So for folks who uh, are interested in seeing some of that city and um, a special district collaboration, that's a good uh, good opportunity. Residents working with a district. Anybody else? A, a couple plugs I'd throw in here. First, the first one is that the reason why you pull the Ivy is because the stuff kills trees and a lot of people aren't aware of that. Um, and it's a way to keep keep our trees going. The second thing I was going to say is because there are so many people in our class that are new to the area, you might not realize the Christmas ships arrival in Milwaukee Bay is a big deal on the nights when it happens. And it, it's a lot of fun. Um, that one. Uh, Oh, the umbrella parade, Dan, you, you, I mean, you could see by the poster, it's pretty cool. But yeah, if you haven't seen one, it's hard to believe how cool it really is. And that, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, that page is up, uh, is up currently on the community calendar. So if you go to uh, milwaukeeoregon.gov, you're able to see that listed on December 4th. But whoever it is who's putting that page together, it's me, hasn't really fleshed it out very well yet for an event that's only two and a half weeks away. So it is absolutely on my big board for tomorrow. Uh, and anybody who would like to come and see uh, some pictures from past years, that's going to be a great place to do it. Uh, oh, also, uh, we will that night be unveiling Milwaukee's newest mascot, Millie. Uh, it's a goose. We've had a lot of fun with that. Uh, as we say here around the strategic engagement team, you can't spell team without goose. Something to think about. Anything else before we move on to the next uh, next bit of housekeeping? I'm sorry, next bit of the uh, next bit of the class. All right. So with that, then I am going to turn this over. Oh, I'm sorry, our class agreements, as always, we will show respect and empathy for each other and guests. We'll seek to be actively involved in the class. We will allow the facilitators to be responsible for keeping the class on time and on track. And even now, even now I stray from time and track. And also we will seek to make Milwaukee, in the words of our own community vision, a flourishing city that is entirely equitable, delightfully livable and completely sustainable. So with that then, I believe now, Hey, look at that. I turn the floor over to our very own Greg Hemer. Greg, take it away. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Scott Stauffer, Milwaukee City Recorder, and I are happy to present tonight's Milwaukee history and community engagement from the past to today. My name is Greg Hemer, the Communications Director of Milwaukee Historical Society, the owners and operators of the world's largest museum dedicated to Milwaukee, Oregon, the Milwaukee Museum, located at 3737 Southeast Adams Street, open Saturdays, 1 to 5 p.m. Yes, we have a museum, that one building you have been driving by for 15 years and have never stopped in. Trust me, it is well worth your time to visit to learn more about our historical past from all perspectives. Milwaukee Museum prides itself in telling all stories as the past is the past no matter if it is good, bad, or ugly. We work with organizations like Oregon Black Pioneers, Clackamas County Heritage Council, and the Grand Ronde to expand our knowledge and tell the histories of all people that have lived in the area we call Milwaukee today. Like it or not, I have been anointed as a Milwaukee historian. Through my years of preserving Milwaukee's history for future generations, I have learned and studied Milwaukee's history through our countless files. We're gonna go on a 40 million year old history in about 15 minutes, so hold on and let's go. Slide. 40 million years ago, the ocean shore was up next to the current location of the Cascade Mountains. Elk Rock is part of a volcano that erupted two miles below the ocean surface, well before the rise of the Cascade Peaks. Lava flows formed the predominant bedrock called Waverly Heights Basalt, which may be the oldest exposed rock in the Portland area. The island is accessible by foot when the Willamette uh, River is low 
via a 40 million year old land bridge extending from the Spring Park natural area. Slide. The Missoula floods refer to the catalytic floods that swept periodically across the eastern Washington and down the Columbia River Gorge at the end of the last ice age. These glacial lake outburst floods were the result of periodic sudden ruptures of the ice dam that created glacial lake Missoula. After each ice dam rupture, the waters of the lake would rush down the Clark Fork and the Columbia River, flooding much of eastern Washington and the Willamette Valley in western Oregon. After the rupture, the ice would reform, creating glacial lake Missoula again. As the water emerged from the Columbia River Gorge, it backed up again at the one mile wide narrows near Kalama, Washington. Some temporary lakes rose to an elevation of more than 400 feet, flooding the Willamette Valley to Eugene, Oregon, and beyond. Iceberg rafted glacial erratics and erosion features are evidence of these events. Lake bottom sediments deposited by the floods have, con have contributed to the agricultural richness of the Willamette and Columbia Valleys. Glacial deposits overlaid with centuries of windblown sediments have scattered steep, suddenly sloping dunes throughout the Columbia Valley. Ideal co conditions for orchards and vineyards development at higher latitudes. Slide. This area was the home of the Clackamas Indians who lived in permanent winter villages and in seasonal settlements. Our local Native Americans as part of the the Upper Chinookian speaking people, the Clackamas, lived on the east bank of the Willamette River below Tumma Water, or what we call the Willamette Falls, and along the east bank of the Willamette River to St. John's into the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. In 1805, Lewis and Clark estimated a Clackamas population of 4,650 people. While the Clackamas were noted fishermen, hunters, and gatherers, their way of life did not include agriculture as we know it. Instead, their way of life is described as one of the seasonal round. Families and tribal groups would return to locations each year throughout their territory from the mountaintops to the river bottoms and all places in between. At each location, resources would be gathered and then brought back to their winter village. During the winter months, the people stayed mostly within their winter villages practicing their utilitarian art, as well as sharing stories with one another. For thousands of years, Willamette Falls has been a significant fishing and trading place for Native Americans. The river was filled with salmon, Pacific lamprey, and other fish, and the banks of the steep falls provided an excellent place to catch these fish as they attempted to climb the falls. Because of this unique topographic and natural resource condition, other Native American tribes traveled sometimes from hundreds of miles away to fish and trade in the area. As part of the settlement, trade, and social traditions practiced by early Native Americans, the Clackamas people res resource had held resource rights to Willamette Falls and the lower Willamette and lower Clackamas rivers and their tributaries. These rights enabled them to collect a fee known as a tribute from visiting tribes for use of the area. In the 1830s to the 40s, European fur trade brought early pioneers to the area and canoe travel among the Willamette River increased. Oregon City was the location of portage around Willamette Falls. The Clackamas people helped early pioneers navigate the steep terrain around the falls and served as guides for travel south into the Willamette Valley. Fur traders, missionaries, and white settlers introduced diseases that decimated the Clackamas. By 1853, only 78 remained, a decline of 98%. The tribe was then forced to Grand Ronde Federation land in 1857. Slide. Early in 1848, Wickham made a donation land claim which encompassed Milwaukee Bay. He built a sawmill at Johnson Creek, a gerst mill at Spring Creek, and a flour mill at Kellogg Creek. All of these empires were empowered by the Creeks. On his claim, he plotted the town of Milwaukee in 1848. In the summer of 1848, news that gold had been discovered in California made its way to the Lama Valley and an exodus of fortune seekers from Oregon ensued. Wickham decided that a surer path to fortune lay with the manufacture and supply of lumber to the boom towns of Northern California. He built a schooner, the Milwaukee, and bought a brig, the Forest, and built a lot Wickham to carry lumber and other goods to markets in California. 
Wickham's mill turned out about 6,000 board feet of rough three inch planks every day in two 12 hour shifts. Material, which brought $300 per thousand of board feet in San Francisco, tripling the, preva the prevailing price in Oregon. Wickham's fortunes were further enhanced by a flood during the winter of 1849, 1850, in which many of his competitors in the lumber industry saw their mills washed away or badly damaged by floodwaters. Wickham similarly enriched himself with the establishment of a flour mill with which he was able to provide flowers to miners at extremely profitable prices. The flour mill created the first road from Tualatin to Milwaukee for the transport of grain. The milling, flour, and shipping businesses provided lucrative and other ships by 1851 added to Wickham's fleet. Wickham used some of his profits to launch the newspaper, the Western Star, supply material for the first schoolhouse and church, and created the first corporation in the territory of Oregon. Milwaukee was 500 strong in 1850, and Milwaukee Bay was the first port of call or official port on the Willamette. Milwaukee also housed the workers who were mining the iron ore in Tyron Creek, left from the explosion of the 40 million year old volcano. Remember those Missoula floods? The Orchardists, the Llewellyn brothers and me also came over the Oregon Trail and brought with them 700 grafted fruit trees, creating Milwaukee as the agricultural center of Clackamas for years to come. It is said that every fruit tree in the Pacific Northwest and Northern California can be traced back to Milwaukee as its original home. The fruits were also loaded on Wickham's boats and sent to California. Milwaukee was the largest town in Oregon, boasting a tin shop, three general stores, a blacksmith, a hotel, and three taverns. Slide. In 1851, Portland was incorporated as a city. It only had a few houses, a sawmill, and a small hotel. But in 1857, after Lot Wickham died, his captains Kerr and Ainsworth bought his boating empire and created the Oregon Navigation Company. They moved their empire to Portland as its home base, sealing the fate of Milwaukee's shipping dreams. By 1861, the Oregon Navigation Company was bringing gold from Idaho and helping to grow a town, and Portland was about 2,600 in population. Oregon City began to emerge as a flower and manufacturing hub. It, it was an easy stop above the falls to unload the grain from Tualatin and mill there. By 1866, Oregon City had the first paper mill. Also, as being the end of the Oregon Trail, migration moved in and started to settle in this area, raising the city's population to about 1,400. Oregon City and Portland both had a stop on the railroad, which eventually connected Washington to California. We still have the path of Oregon and the California Rail Railroad in front of the museum on 37th and Railroad, where the train tracks are still today the ones that stop you during midday. Now, just because the two cities to the north and south dominated our commercial enterprises, it did not mean that Milwaukee was abandoned. Seth Welling was Oregon's first horticulturist, started the Oregon State Fair, and is best known with Ah Bing for creating the Bing Cherry, but also created at least 10 other varieties of fruits and nuts. The original landholders or donation land claims began to get subdivided, and sold, allowing for migration. It was important to the growth of Milwaukee during this time period. Families coming across the Oregon Trail, namely Germans and Italians, with Japanese from the West, started to buy land and begin farming in this area. An electric trolley came to Milwaukee in 1892. The trolley was built from Portland to Oregon City, but other lines were added as well. The trolley not only served passengers, but also allowed for local farm produce to transport into city markets. Slide. Mayor Schindler was the first mayor of Milwaukee when we were incorporated in 1903. When he was elected, the city was a shanty place, a place that needed change, a leader, and industry. Those were the days of large livestock and tree stumps with mud and dust to constitute our roads. Now, Milwaukee wasn't a one-horse town as Lot Wickham left some remnants of industry and Seth Willing was still creating fruit. The Lullings were very active in their community, were leaders in the local Farmers Alliance and the Progressive Movement. Along Main Street, there was a schoolhouse and two blacksmith shops. Milwaukee and Sydney have did not have much to offer or even pay into the government. Heck, even the sheriff had to pay for his own bullets. 
but one place was taxed, the Friars Club. The Friars Club was a place to drink, gamble, and sow your wild oats. It was much aligned by Portland and Oregon City, but did pay about $1,000 a year in taxes to pay for the development of downtown. The city protected its right to produce tax revenue so much that the sheriff doubled as its bouncer. By 1908, downtown was becoming a little city with paved sidewalks, new storefronts, and even cows no longer in the streets. Crystal Lake Park and Elk Rock Dance Hall opened its doors, and soon Milwaukee was going to have a new reputation. Slide. Now, it is true that during this time period, rapid reproduction reduction in prices over farm goods was a problem, but Milwaukee was changing from an agricultural city to an entertainment capital for the Portland elites. Kellogg Lake, three times its size as it is today, making it a great place to swim and boat. The trolley brought people down from the hustle and bustle of Portland and, and Crystal Lake Park could entertain them for a nickel a day. The visitors could fish, play baseball, go to the zoo, go bowling, or just relax. Island Station became the summer house retreat area for the rich. Most of the homes built there from 1920 to 1929 were vacation houses. Downtown developed local markets and businesses like banks, furniture shops, five and dimes, groceries, restaurants, and an area in, and an arena in an old trolley barn and other amenities needed for upscale homeowners. Businesses like sawmills, lumber stores, gas stations, and feed stores are supplying jobs and opportunities for residents. Outside of the city, the family farms were starting to diminish and land was being sold in smaller plots to accommodate smaller homes. The Union High School was built along with Milwaukee Elementary. PNC Tools began manufacturing of handmade tools and was the largest employer for the residents. And of course, Elk Rock Island was the best place in town supporting the dance hall slide. Milwaukee suffers just as the rest of the country does, but its family farms keep the economy growing. As the Portland elite cannot afford their summer homes, new building and, and the entertainment businesses dies in Milwaukee because of the stock market crash. Crystal Lake Park is closed and Elk Rock Dance Hall ends all activity and is not rebuilt after a fire. But the New Deal programs begins to shape Milwaukee's character as it looks today. In 1936, the Pioneer Children began the Milwaukee Historical Society. In 1937, the new superhighway or McLaughlin Boulevard connects Portland to Oregon City near the river and through downtown Milwaukee. By 1938, Milwaukee gained two iconic buildings, Milwaukee Junior High, which is now known as Portland Waldorf, and Milwaukee City Hall. Both of these buildings were part of the Public Works Administration. Milwaukee's economy started to see an uptick during the war years. Men joined the armed for forces while women were introduced into factories making a living. Water Tower Park even saw an air raid tower that was manned 24 hours a day. Public housing called Kellogg Park was built to house over 100 families to work in the shipyards. PNC Tool also grew as they made wrenches for the wartime effort. The government also forced Japanese families into internment camps. Very little of the Japanese population were able to keep their land and it decimated the Japanese population in Milwaukee. By the end of the war, by the end of the war, Milwaukee had become 5,000 residents strong. Slide. After the war, there was a big need for housing and industry in Milwaukee. The idea of suburbs is invented as automobiles are now affordable for the middle class. The trolley line, no longer needed, is shut down in 1858. The American dream of owning, of owning a house with a little patch of grass explodes in Milwaukee. The family farms are all but gone, but the new technologies in building make it easier and cheaper to build. By 1970, the population of Milwaukee triples to over 16,000 residents. The old great. Kellogg Park is converted into industrial lands and businesses like Pendleton Woolen Mills and Oregon Worsted open plants to manufacture woolen shirts while Oregon Saw Manufacturer Company and Carlton Corporation produced forestry equipment. International Harvester manufactured agricultural machinery and equipment. Downtown was vibrant and thriving with stores, shopping, and being the center of activity. I-5 was completed in 1966, 
allowing for goods to ship from Canada to Mexico up and down the West Coast. Even though we suffered through the Columbus Day storm in 1962 and the flood of 1964, this time period creates a lot of what we see in Milwaukee today. We have our own school district, food station, and library. Slide. Hey, Greg. I just wanted to check with you. You said the uh, trolley line was shut down in 1858. That was 1958. I'm sorry, 1958. Yeah. 1958. Thanks. All right, here we go. Sorry, I'm reading as fast as I possibly can. Interstate I-205 was completed in 1983, providing a new route to connect the east side together. Highway 224 is completed, which provides an expressway from McLaughlin to the new I-205. This opens up new opportunities for land near transportation. A new industrial park opens on industrial way, bringing jobs into Milwaukee. Milwaukee Marketplace is developed with shopping, restaurants, and a new grocery store. Also two malls, Clackamas Town Center and Clackamas Promenade allow Milwaukeeans a new place to shop in convenience. Apartment buildings are added near the downtown core as the first city comprehensive plan is finished in 1983. Now downtown being bypassed by Highway 224 and McLaughlin, the new shopping malls, and the effects of the 70s bad economy, downtown Milwaukee is no longer a shopping mecca. Retail businesses close, but real estate is cheap. Dark Horse Comics purchases a few blocks in 1986, establishing its corporate headquarters here. Milwaukee's population boosts to around 20,000 residents. Slide. With land prices soaring and housing becoming a premium, Happy Valley is born. Happy Valley, from a population of almost zero to 11,000 people, becomes the wealthiest per capita city in Oregon. It takes a lot to start a new city, like schools, parks, and fire districts. And with Milwaukee and surrounding Clackamas areas seeing very little growth, combining amenities is a good deal. North Clackamas Parks, North Clackamas School District, and North Clackamas Fire District are all formed. Metro becomes the regional governor and is tasked with becoming the regional planner. Milwaukee sees very little development or change except Bob's Red Mill and Dave's Killer Bread joins the industrial district. Downtown loses its grocery store, but gains its first development since the 1960s called Main Street Village. Milwaukee population remains at 20,000, but Milwaukee's older generation is starting to relocate. Slide. Here we are today. Light Rail came to Milwaukee in 2015 with fanfare and pinning its hopes and dreams on bringing development. Kronberg Park, Milwaukee Bay Park, South Downtown, and other projects are, initi are initiatives to stimulate Milwaukee Downtown. A new high school and large apartment complex are changing Milwaukee skyline. Land pressure is finally opening new, opportunity in, new opportunities in Milwaukee. Houses are being torn down and rebuilt. Land is being re land is being developed and Milwaukee's reputation is changing from old and stagnant to bright and vital. The older generation is downsizing and a younger generation is moving in. Slide. It is very rare when a historian can see a year in the present that will have impact for the rest of its residents' lives. 2020 may be one of the greatest years Milwaukee has ever seen. It created structures, gatherings, and people that will be remembered for at least the next 100 years or more. In late 2019, Main and Washington Street open up with improvements, a plaza and a brand new building called Axletree. On January 11th, the new and improved Letting Library opens to the public. January 25th, Kronberg Park multi-use path, including the bridge opens to the public. June 19th, Milwaukee Bay hosts the largest protest in its history, Black Lives Black Lives Matter sit in for solidarity. August, new mural of nature painted on Chan Staker. August 18th, comprehensive plan determined future land use adopted. October 22nd, new mural unveiling, unveiled featuring Ah Bing and the Hadleys at 40th and Harvey Street. November 3rd, Milwaukee elects its first black city councilor, uh, Desi Nicodemus. And in December, the Milwaukee High School is almost completed. Oh yeah, don't forget COVID-19, masks, Zoom meetings, family closes, and missing friends, plus a presidential election, and waiting for the year to end. For us historians and Milwaukeeans, we'll remember this year finally for the beauty and connection we created for the future. 
slide. So that ends my presentation, and I think we're jumping into Scott's. <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at this moment. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, really nice talk. Just love it. Um, when was it that, what is this? I'm looking at 1962 Dogwood City of the West. When did it shift from kind of family farms to more, um, you know, small, these small World, house, World War II, buildings? World War II, the coming back of the vets of World War II is really the key. Um, so what happens is that we had all these family farms, right? Um, um, and once the interstates and once the connectivity, when uh, the soldiers came back home uh, with the booming economy, kind of changed, you know, the local area. Um, and it changed local areas for everybody. And suburbia became kind of the, the new idea, oh, right? Oh, the rise of suburbia, and, 50s, and so 50s, 60s? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, literally Roughly? from 46 to, to 50. Okay, thank you. Wow. Reminds you of that song, uh, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. What, what's that, Kassan? Right, it. it certainly does. Drove my Chevy yeah. to the levee and the levee was dry. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I had a question too. Yes. Um, I live in the Linwood neighborhood, and when y'all were speaking about the farmland and, and the orchards and such, there's this large, I assume it was it was farmland at some point that covers, I don't know how many, like a square mile or something like that. Is, am I, do you know that place? Nope, yeah, right over there by Fernberg Park, I'm assuming that you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, that. Uh, right, so that is the Castanella's land. Um, that is one of those family farms, right? If you wanted to imagine what a family farm looked like, uh, that area that you see over there is basically the size of a family farm. So it's about um, uh, 20 acres, maybe uh, 10 to 20 acres, if you kind of look at it. Um, uh, those are two, the, uh, there is one remaining brother that still lives on that property. Um, and his father started that farm uh, Italian family um, that started that farm uh, back in the uh, 1900s, 1920s. Okay, so that's, that's uh, been passed down from the generations then from what that correct, is. Correct, correct. And then I figure that's the last one in, in, in Clackamas County or, or Milwaukee that kind of still... And, and, yeah, so you got, you got some interesting open land. Um, uh, if you're over there in the Linwood neighborhood, if you ever drive down Stanley, uh, there seems to be this open field um, uh, off, well, depending on which way you go. Uh, those are owned by two sisters uh, that kind of hold over by the family farms. Uh, you know where, if you know where Minthorn um, a Wildlife Refuge is, across the street, there's still kind of some woods there. I know they, uh, you know where 40, that new little spot by 42nd got developed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was owned by the Wantanabis. They were one of the Japanese uh, farmers that lived here. They farmed on Minthorn and owned that property all the way up to uh, basically Adam Street, right? <laughs> to kind of give you some uh, reference. Um, uh, they sold off that section of 42nd and there's still that vacant land that kind of sits in between um, uh, 42nd and yeah, right? 42nd and Adams or railroad, however you want to call it, to wherever the triangle by right by the Milwaukee Museum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is still wooded. They still own that land. Um, and so there, those are kind of the remnants of the family farms that you still can kind of see. There's still a Christmas tree farm off Lake Road, too. Half of it went away. So so hey, <clears throat> question. Uh, uh, Greg, right? Yes. Sorry. And um so I'm I'm not a local historian, but I am I am a historian. Um, it's East Asia, uh, but um, and I love history. I just think it's a great thing to include in our lives. It informs the present so much. So it's really fun to think about and uh, delve into. What what do what what do what do what are people doing uh, historically uh, for writing history or recording history? 
or is anyone doing anything? Well, what is it that you do? Like, you know, what's going on? And um, what a fun thing to do. I just love this um, stories of you know, my daughters are half Japanese. I love the story of, uh, of, a Jap of, this, of this Japanese family. It makes everything seem so much more meaningful. So um, just like all of you will be, you don't realize it yet, but you will. You'll get sucked into your community. And when I say sucked, in a positive and really good way. The reason why I started with the Milwaukee Museum is because I was serving on the uh, Design and Landmarks Committee. And we went down there to go do a research property or do some research on, on historic home property. And once I walked inside that place, I fell in love with it. Um, we worked we have been working so hard uh, to expand our knowledge. And what is hard as a non-trained historian, right? Somebody that just loves the history is that history is made every day. And since the beginning of the internet, it seems to be recorded every day for posterity, right? Uh, so it's hard to determine, right? What is history and what isn't? But what the Milwaukee Museum recognizes is, is that there has been a division of history since we're all started, all of us kind of in Clackamas County, actually all of us out here in the West, we all started with this New Deal program and it was focused on the pioneers, right? So you just, you just focus on the pioneers and ignore the rest, right? Um, uh, what we know at the Milwaukee Museum is that we have great partners with the Oregon Black Pioneers, the Grand Ron, uh, we are now working with the um, Japanese uh, Oregon Museum. Um, and we've set up these lecture series uh, to be able to expand our knowledge and to explain it to our residents. So um, February this year, uh, we'll do a Japanese American um, with the Japanese uh, Museum of Oregon. Um, we'll do a Catherine Gray in March. Uh, she's a black woman suffrage, uh, suffragist that lived here in uh, Milwaukee. Um, we'll do a, a house uh, kind of preservation, talk about the historic homes in Milwaukee in June. And in October, we expect to have a, an, an, an indigenous people uh, celebration. I don't know everything. I only know what I know. And uh, here's an interesting thing. So uh, about a month ago, um, uh, a gentleman by the uh, Dr. Lewis uh, published a paper uh, that explained um, the uh, uh, papers between the government and kind of the local people that were running the government at the time about uh, collecting the Indians, right? And somebody that I admire and love, I play him as a character, Lot Wickham, certainly played a part in that. He was ordered to go out and go round up Clackamas Indians. It destroyed me because I thought that our founding fathers were fairly what I call pure. They were abolitionists. They were Quakers. Um, they started the suffrage movements. They were progressives. Um, um, but once we learn that history, it is important. We printed it out. We put it into our files. And in fact, in our December pilot uh, uh, issue that we're gonna say, we're talking about that very same issue to let the public know that, hey, look, history is messy, right? It's messy. Uh, people that we revered in the past may not be pure. And uh, we need just to tell the story as the truth and the way that it happened and let the people decide uh, how they wanna judge it. Greg, you've got a couple of people uh, in the class who've raised their hands and been waiting quite a while. Uh, I'm sorry. Sarah and Danielle. Uh, Sarah, why don't you go first? I think you're muted. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was actually wondering, you mentioned um, in World War II and the Japanese internment camps, how many Japanese families left Milwaukee after that. Do you uh, have an idea of how many Six. Um, 
Japanese family were in the area yeah, so we, prior to that. So we had that. six. We had the Endos, Yash Yashishimas, the Koidas, the Watanabes, and two of them that I'm escaping the name off the top of my head. Uh, but we had six. And so if you think about it, um, it was about 10 to 15 percent of uh, the kids that were at uh, Milwaukee, uh, well, what we call Milwaukee High School, not Union High School. Um, and so okay. um, if you think about it that way, that they were probably 10 to 15 percent of our population, that's basically what got removed. Now, uh, there right. are and stories. I actually, I'm, actually, I'm actually close to the Watanabe's. Uh -huh. um, and uh, Ruth Watanabe is my across the street neighbor. She's 93. Yes. Um, and she's she's the one who got me interested in Milwaukee history and all of this and pretty much is why I'm here today um, because she's just such an amazing resource of information. And that wooded area you were referring to that the Watanabe still own, um, I don't know if you, you probably were aware, but maybe not. There used to be a Japanese Buddhist temple there that they would use as a Japanese community center and have Japanese classes after school for the children. And it just blew my mind, like learning this stuff from her. Cause like you said, you learn the history of the pioneers and the Oregon trail. And, you know, her husband is third generation Milwaukee farmer and he's 96 years old. Right. Yeah. So it's like, their history is so much deeper than so many of our families are. Um, and it's just, it's not being represented. Yeah. And, and in fact, if, um, if you could shoot me an email, uh, I would love to have a conversation with Ruth, uh, with Ruth, I'm sorry. Uh, the Watanabe's yeah. uh, have been elusive. Uh, at time, mm -hmm. elusive is not the right word. Uh, elusive at well, times. Ruth, I would say Ruth is a little elusive. That's probably yeah. a good description of her. She's, right. Uh, you know, and, she's and we've like, been trying to have a yeah, we've been trying to have a conversation with her uh, mm -hmm. for a long time, and we would love the introduction. Yeah, I mean, and she is just so sharp still, you know, and she's out there. You know, I try to help her and take out her garbage cans and stuff for her. And she's like, nope, I do it myself. And it's out there shoveling snow. And oh my gosh. But yeah, she's amazing. Danielle? Sarah, thank you for that. That was, that's so fascinating. I was interested in hearing more about that segment as well. Um, kind of like maybe along a similar theme. And you actually touched on this after I raised my hand, Greg. So I don't know if you need to say that much more about it, but I'm really interested in learning more about um, the, like the nature of the interactions between white settlers and the Clackamas tribe um, during that time period. And Lot Whitcomb's, um, you know, actions when it comes to Indian removal um, in the area and, and, and maybe like just touching a little bit on what Sarah said, like wondering like where that's visible in our, in this town and, and where that's like, there's efforts to make that more visible. Um, and, um, I, yeah, I don't know if you have any answers, but, um, it's, it's certainly something I'm interested in learning more about and wondering how to access. Um, just like, um, just like the rest of the, uh, um, uh, the West, we lived in a perception of the way that we dominated it, right? The white settlers. Um, we, we have been bad about recognizing other people's histories. There's a lot of things, uh, distrust, um, uh, lack of communication. Um, uh, the museum has certainly uh, tried to open those doors. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with the Oregon Black Pioneers, we certainly have opened our, uh, our understanding of the importance that Black Americans have played uh, in the role of Milwaukee. Um, we are working very hard to uh, work with the Grand Ron and other organizations 
um, that certainly uh, talk about the indigenous people to get their story inside of our museum. Um, the uh, Japanese uh, story, we, we, we semi have, and last year we had this conversation. I don't know if Dan still has that email with all the stories and hopefully he'll share with the group um, that explains, we, we talk about the Japanese farmers in, in our history, um, um, but we certainly don't go you know, beyond uh, that. And so um, as we explore uh, other people's perceptions, uh, we, the museum will get better at that. And the city, the, uh, I, I don't wanna say that, the, I, I don't wanna speak for the city. And, uh, but I, I still, the city, right? 10 years ago, still had that same perception that the museum has. And as we all try to get out other people's perspectives, we'll get better at telling the story. Thank you. I, uh, I absolutely do have that, <clears throat> excuse me, goodness sake, do have that uh, email chain, Greg, so I'll make sure to get that out. And uh, Sarah, I will make sure to connect uh, to connect you. We'll get you Greg's email so that you can reach out to him. Um, yeah, I, I would love to talk to, we've been trying for the last eight years. Yeah, I mean, she's told me so many amazing stories and I've actually mentioned to her before about talking to someone at the Milwaukee Museum because you, you guys are just right down the street from us. Um, and she's just, uh, I don't know, you catch her at the right moment and she'll talk your ear off, but you know, she's sometimes she's just on her own little mission, so. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways that, you know, maybe I could talk to her and get some of it recorded where she might feel more comfortable um, you know, she's kind of adopted us as a, as a grandma to my kids. And so we're, we're very, she's very familiar with us, but I don't know if she would be willing to do it to, with someone else, you know? And so the museum has video equipment. If we mm -hmm. could just be in the room as you talk to her, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I will bring it up to her. I, I did bring it up to her. Um, it was actually right before COVID started. And then, you know, it didn't, bring it up again because obviously at her age she's not been going out and stuff with COVID but um you know we'll we'll see what we can do <laughs> uh, to to uh to Rebecca's point in the chat probably some reasonable cautiousness there uh I do I do want to say uh that we have a, a comment here from uh, or, or a question here from Anand Anand would you like to 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 uh say that for yourself or or I'm happy to read the question uh Either, either which way. Yeah, uh, Greg, I, one. I used to live uh, in the apartments right behind uh, Kellogg Creek, and I was surprised about how close the apartments were to the creek, almost like I could go to the water's edge. And, uh, I was, uh, and I was surprised in a sense that it seemed like such a pristine space, and still there was a lot of construction that had developed there. Uh, so could you give some context as to how that came about? and? If that's how things are usually done. Uh, before before you respond, Greg, I, I do want to say we're going to get into a bit about community development and specifically some of the development plans for the city uh, in, I would have to go back and look, I want to say it's March, it might be April when we have our uh, planning and community development uh, teams join us. So in terms of in terms of historical context, uh, uh, Greg, please take it away. But if there's anything that you're um, that when we're talking about a little bit more recent, uh, we, we are going to have a chance to get a good deep dive on that uh, with the planning and community development teams in a couple of months. So what I can tell you is, is that um, um, they dam the, the, the they dam Kellogg Creek in 1847, right, to create power for um, uh, the flour mills. Um, and uh, what that is, is that that created this, this lake. Uh, the lake demographically has shrunk down three times its size from what it was. And, that, and that's partly in due uh, to development, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it used to be a, a place of uh, enjoyment, boating, swimming, uh, people would ice skate on it. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, our, 
one and only uh, firefighter that lost their lives, a uh, lost their life saving a child uh, from them falling into the ice there. Um, and so you're right. Uh, you would think that it would be a little bit more activity driven, uh, but as I, I don't know how deep of a dive uh, Dan will get into the community development of it, uh, but it is, certainly has been semi forgotten uh, as a landscape uh, in Milwaukee. And that's because it's closed off from the public, really, in all reality. Okay, thank you. I, I could jump in and just point out that regulations uh, to establish setbacks from bodies of water and other environmentally sensitive lands are a relatively new development uh, or new non-development maybe is a better way to look at it. But I'm just saying uh, you see it all along Johnson Creek as well. Uh, Kellogg Creek, you're just talking about the lower portion, but Kellogg Creek's a big creek in terms of uh, how far it runs uh, to the east. And you see, a, you see that especially in things built before about 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and, and don't forget that Kellogg Lake, uh, by the time that it uh, got around after World War II, uh, in the 50s and 60s, when we were rapidly developing, was not an important feature. It was filled in uh, to, build, uh, uh, to build things onto and uh, used as, uh, basically used as just a, a remnant of the past that wasn't important. We are, uh, we're not right at seven. We do have a few more minutes. And of course, Greg and Scott will both be back with us uh, after our break. But uh, at this point, does anybody have any additional questions? Uh, plenty of opportunity after the break too. Don't want to rush anybody. But any, any additional questions, uh, comments, things to say? Uh, yeah, hey, Greg. Um, <clears throat> so I, I put a comment, but is there some kind of a, like a group or a meeting or a chat group or a website or where people talk about this? So maybe it's uh, only just you. <laughs> right. <know>. So <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, um, uh, Milwaukee Museum has what they call Watts blog on it. So www.milwaukeemuseum.com yeah. uh, has Watts blog. Uh, but uh, two of the greatest sites is uh, on social media. Uh, you know, you're from uh, Milwaukee when and they show all these uh, really cool kind of pictures and people kind of chat about it. And uh, Milwaukee community, uh, those two sites have a tendency to kind of talk a, a little bit about uh, Milwaukee history, or if you have a question, um, they, they have a tendency to kind of get back to me somehow uh, mm -hmm. when somebody has a question, so. Fun, fun, great. Yeah, I just really want to point out uh, you know you're if you're from Milwaukee if you say Milwaukee in two syllables. Milwaukee. Greg, is the museum having monthly meetings at this point? Uh, we we um, we we've cut back our monthly meetings uh, because of the library lecture series, um, and uh, we decided before COVID started that we we're going to just kind of do it uh, at random uh, every now and then. Um, and since COVID has hit, we haven't organized ourselves to be able to do something like that. And now's the time to start to write some history. And uh, local history is as good as any, if not better than most, and uh, can tell us a lot about the rest of the world that we are thinking about perhaps in these days. And so I would say, uh, you know, start a nice popular project and get people involved in it. And um, and that would be cool. That'd be fun. So you'd have a purpose to me. You'd just be dreaming it up or planning it or executing it in any random way. It doesn't have to be a big deal. But if there's a sort of a goal, it'd be fun to work on. I think it would really, it's, I feel really, uh, as I am a trained historian and I've never done anything like this, this sounds really cool. Yeah. So um, we have this, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have a Milwaukee 2023 project is what we call it. Uh, we are going around and, interview and interviewing longtime residents, and uh, we'll be out on the streets uh, as well, uh, interviewing uh, anybody who wants to talk to our camera. 
Uh, we will record these interviews. We have a Milwaukee Heritage Channel that uh, if you have not visited on YouTube yet, you should. Um, there are some, uh, it has all of our old library lecture series on it, um, as well as other bits and pieces of Milwaukee history uh, with that. And we'll show all those. And our goal is to uh, uh, put together a short video for city council and we call it Milwaukee 2023 because that's our 120th uh, anniversary of incorporation, so. Uh, I am, you know, knee deep in historical research. I just, just you know, it's a, not an employed historian, but it's what I do. And, uh, and uh, it's important to me and uh, it feels like I need to make a project that's local. I need to figure that out for myself and uh, extend my interest in the local community, which is an obvious direction to go. Uh, because um, we're all, in what we do, we're really all just pursuing our own selves. And uh, if you can connect to the local community, uh, even if you're making a national or global argument, I think that's, that's a really good thing. So I'm gonna have to figure out my own little project. It's fun. I'll have to find out more. Thank you. Yeah. Very inspiring talk too. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been called this before, but I will. Mr. Muscle Monk. Oh, uh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, if, if you want some help, right, uh, contact uh, the museum email or get our email from Dan. Get my email from Dan. I'm the yeah. one that does the email anyways. And yeah. we can try to find a, a path to help you out any which way that you want to want to. Pursue. Yeah, I just, you know. I, you know, I think being an expert means that you really, you know what you don't, you know what you don't know. Yep. You know what you know enough so that you're like, I don't know. It. And it's like, that's what an expert is. It's like, well, I'm going to go find it. And, uh, you know, we, we have to dig deep and then we go broad. I just know nothing, man. And I've never even thought about it. And uh, so I'll just have to get my uh, fancy tickled, my interest tickled here and figure out what connections are can come. And uh Shouldn't take too much work, but I will uh, love to get uh, involved and uh, I'm happy to be in this class. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. What do you think, Dan? Well, I was going to say, as we go into break, I do just want to make sure to uh, call out Rebecca's comment here about uh, the uh, uh, website OregonNikkei.org. Um, uh, and she had suggested in the comments that you could contact the organization and ask them to collaborate with you on an oral history project. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to say anything more about that before we go to break? Yeah, the Japanese, uh, the, that project in Old, Old Town, um, Portland has been going on for quite a long time. And um, one, of my, one of my prior colleagues at Willamette University, Linda Tamura, whose family was one of the relocated Japanese American farmers, um, who she became a professor of education. She's been involved with the Nikkei organization and they currently have an exhibition about Japanese American uh, women in Oregon. And so it seems really relevant that you might connect with them and, uh, and, and find someone in addition to this wonderful neighbor who I just love hearing that neighborly connection with uh, who, who might reach out to the, to uh, the elder here in, Milwaukee. Really fantastic and a, and a great resource. I'm checking out the web page right now. Um, for anybody who is not sure what we're talking about, please check the chat log for this, uh, uh, for this session. Uh, really fantastic stuff. Uh, with that, we are coming right up on seven o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and call it there, Stefan, if that's all right with you. Absolutely. Alrighty. Uh, so folks, we're going to take uh, just a little over 10 minutes and we'll see you back here at 710 uh, when we will get back into the class. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. So that was the break, although actually I guess that's going to be an uninterrupted clip. Uh, but here we are. Uh, still 10 minutes, not 11 minutes into the future, and we're going to go right back to uh, to our presentation. This is going to be from Scott Stoffer, our city recorder. Let me go ahead and do that screen share right now. Do, do, and do, do, Scott, do. before you jump in here, let me challenge everybody in the class to make note of what was really the driving force behind incorporating this city. 
It's one of the most fascinating things I've learned from Scott in the past. This is, yeah, this is an aha moment for somebody for sure. So here we go. Uh, alrighty, share. And let's go ahead and go through our go through our steps. Slideshow, we're going to present it from current slide. And inevitably, we're going to go ahead and swap them. Alrighty, big screen. Big screen. Big screen. Alrighty, Scott, go ahead, take it away. Well, with that gauntlet thrown down, Stefan, I hope I remember to say what I said last year, because unlike my great colleague, Greg, I just kind of wing it. So, and I can see all your faces. So if I see something, I'll try to respond and react. And I can also see the chat. <clears throat> so interrupt me. I also have uh, a linear approach to thinking and speaking in terms instead of a cyclical. So I might just go down a tangent, Dan and Stefan and Greg and Frank, anybody say, Scott, what are you talking about? Please stop, return to what you're supposed to talk about, Milwaukee, Oregon. So you like a hawk, Scott, don't even try it this year. And Dan, don't forget who your supervisor is until <laughs> Kelly comes back on December 1st. Anyway, all that being said, we're gonna, we're gonna pr progress here. Um, Scott, stop for city recorder. I'll do things a little backwards. I'll tell you what I do here at the end of what I'm about to tell you. Uh, it'll become pretty clear pretty quickly. One of the best things I get to do, one of the things I love the most about my job is uh, the ability to be uh, one of the city's historians. And <clears throat> forgive my voice, I am, if you didn't hear uh, during the break, I was telling Stefan, but I'm recovering from a bit of a cold. Uh, so that might slow me down tonight. So that might all actually benefit you too. Uh, so if I become hard of hearing, let me know and I'll, I'll speak up. But uh, I'm gonna focus on uh, some of the, the historical points you'll see on the screen and that I'll mention, Greg has covered. That's great, we'll just, we'll just maybe take on a new angle on it, or we'll just go by it real quick. A lot of what, what I'm gonna talk about is uh, what you might call the institutional history of our, our community. And uh, as we've kind of discussed at the end of the last segment and, and, and since then is, we don't know what we don't know. And, and I can tell you the history that has been relayed to us because my predecessors in my office wrote down, you know, took minutes. And so a lot of the community history that I'm going to relate to you, we know because of that. Uh, that's not the whole story of our community. That's not the whole story of, of any community, any city. Um, so fully aware of that. Uh, I have been a history of a student of, of Oregon history my whole life. I grew up in, in North Portland and I went to college on the West Coast and I ended up, you know, just six miles uh, from where I grew up in Portland is where I live and work today. Uh, so I know what I know and what I've heard, but that's not the whole story. And uh, the information about Lot Whitcomb that was revealed literally to uh, most of this community three weeks ago, I revealed, my, my, a better way to say is re rediscovered three weeks ago, um, is, is, is still being absorbed. And, and that's uh, part of our work. I think uh, it was mentioned earlier, you know, part of the work of, of being a historian is looking for the stories we don't know, uh, building the relationships to folks who do know the stories so we can write those stories down, get those stories recorded. And, and frankly, in this time and age, somebody who looks like me, I need to do what I can to promote voices that have not been heard or who have not been historically allowed to be heard. So that's, that's the work that we're doing that uh, we're working hard at the city to do. And so all that is a disclaimer to say, this is 2021, we've all lived through the last year and a half and uh, the story is being written, uh, re, re, the stories are being reevaluated. So with that, I'll dive right in. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about is is city institutional history, but it'll touch on uh, a lot of what Greg said, talked about too. And I will try to go quickly. I tend to have a problem with that. So, sorry, here we go. Uh, as Greg mentioned, uh, the, the, the common story, uh, the white story of Milwaukee, Oregon begins in the 1840s. There was activity on this site a little bit before in terms of European American settlers, the first ship, uh, a sailing ship from a, a Western civilization, civil, Western civilization, American. Um, it was the Owyhee. It came down the, the Willamette River in the early 1800s. And there's some research that suggests blankets that that ship distributed at the falls contributed uh, to the loss of that 98% loss of the people of this area. Uh, shortly thereafter, a gentleman by the name, I believe, of Andrew Fellows built the first known um, settlement on this spot uh, on the bank of the Willamette River right here. He built a cabin. He didn't last very long here. It was a, uh, uh, by 1847, when, when Lot Whitcomb, who had been born in Vermont, 
uh, moved west through uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, served in the Illinois State Legislature, and then ended up here on the banks of the Willamette River. By the time he got here in 1847, uh, maybe Henry, Henry Fellows. Anyway, the, lot, the cabin was still there, but it was decrepit. A lot stayed one winter in it before he built his own place. So 1847, folks like Lot Whitcomb and the Llewellyn family, which if you want a fascinating history of a family, the brothers Seth and Henderson are a fascinating comparison in very different lifestyles. Uh, the museum has information about them. They all get here, they start forming a city. As Greg said, by, the, uh, by 1850, there were enough folks uh, settled on the banks of the Willamette River here that we got our own post office which we've maintained our own post office ever since. Uh, and we were de 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 uh, designated by the United States Congress as a port of delivery. The definition of which is a little bit elusive because we're no really sure exactly what that meant, except that maybe mail boats were sure, more sure to stop here on their way as would prove out between bigger ports at Oregon City and Portland. So uh, that's when folks first showed up here. Uh, the story between the 1850s and the end of the 19th century by the 1890s is growth, but it's it's the booming of, of farms. It's not uh, necessarily infill, it's not Main Street per se yet, uh, kind of like Greg said. However, by eight, the 1890s, institutions like the Oregon Navigation Company and something I think was called the East Portland Railroad Company or something like that, uh, the population in the area of Portland had become big enough to have those very, very popular trolley cars Many big cities uh, 100 years ago had them, mostly electric, uh, run on electric wires. They'd go on, tra uh, on train tracks. And they'd spread, they were spread all over the place. They were actually, a, a, you know, sometimes light rail is considered to be um, uh, controversial because it's, you know, infrastructure and that. But we had that before. We had a version of light rail before, and it was the interurban trolley. And it arrived in Milwaukee, Oregon in 1893 when a line from Portland uh, down largely what is now the Springwater past Gulf Junction, which Gulf Junction was at uh, more or less um, where the spring water heads east or where the spring water comes from the east and dead ends into the Waverly area in our city and the trolley trail that we know now the, the pathway uh, that came down uh, from Portland uh, along Milwaukee's waterfront and on its way to Oregon City through Oak Grove and Gladstone. That arrived in the 1890s and that was a, a really big game changer. Uh, before that, it would take, you know, probably a few hours, a couple hours at least by horse and buggy to get here from Milwaukee to Portland or to Oregon City, not really making us much of a, of a good destination for commuters. But with the trolley that arrived in the 1890s, uh, you know, that we just primed Milwaukee to grow. Uh, around the turn of the century, uh, so Stefan, this is the story, if I don't remember to say what you would surprise you, let me know. But by, by the end of the, the, by 1900, there were enough people here in Milwaukee and there was enough um, transportation infrastructure in place uh, that folks started saying, you know, we, we better start thinking about becoming a city. And one of the issues that really tipped the scale in terms of getting folks here organized was the storage of explosives. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the trains are here, not just the light urban, interurban rail, rail, commuter rail, but also the heavy rail, uh, now the Union Pacific line and the line, the little spur line that goes, oh, it's the Portland and Western that goes through the Island Station neighborhood through downtown. You know, we have Union Pacific that cuts uh, down along 224. Um, th those, those lines were here too, and those were heavy rail. And because the local, there was no local control of, of storage of things like that, uh, the, the folks around Milwaukee said, you know, one of the things we really need to do is we need to become a city so we can stop railroads from storing these dangerous explosives in our city. So after a couple year uh, lobbying effort of our state legislature at the time, uh, in 1903, the people of Milwaukee secured incorporation. Um, uh, it was kind of a two or three step process. In 1903, the state house, the state assembly approved our uh, incorporation and the governor signed the bill. For some reason, the state Senate didn't get around to saying, okay, here, approving that same bill until 1905. But we celebrate 1903 as the year that the city became, uh, Milwaukee became a city. Originally, the town of Milwaukee, uh, the city of Milwaukee. And the very first thing that the city council did when it met in June of that year was it uh, passed an ordinance. The very first ordinance was to outlaw the storage of explosives and nitroglycerin in city limits. So they delivered on their promises, those very first politicians. 
view that picture there, the group of men with the mustachios and the, the pocket watches, that's members of our first and second city council, Mayor William Schindler, who Greg, I think mentioned, has the white hat kind of sitting in the middle. Uh, and then there's some other characters, uh, the gentleman on the far, on the far left, I guess, with the mustache and the hat kind of cocked like that, that's Philip Streeb, he was our second mayor and a local banker. Uh, so 1903, we were incorporated as a city, the first, they set to work banning explosives. Uh, and then in those first few years, they started paving sidewalks, they started passing ordinances uh, to ban, like Greg said, livestock roaming through the streets and uh, issuing contracts when taxation, when the taxes started rolling in, issuing contracts to build uh, sewer lines, some of which originally, I, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I think they were wooden, but eventually the early ones were also clay. And uh, I, I hear enough from engineering to know that it's just very recently we've finished or we're almost finished removing all that clay uh, sewer piping uh, that has been in effect since the very beginning, all those 120 years ago almost. Um, so 1903 was the year uh, we started. Stefan, did I miss anything in, in that? You're muted. Just the, the thing about explosives, um, that another part of that is it was kind of a, a Wild West tradition of Oregonians, whether they were farmers or loggers, to have a box of dynamite at home. Because uh, you never know when you might need to blow up a tree or move a rock out of a path or something. And uh, it was pretty common, including in, uh, in our neighborhood right here when, uh, when we moved into Llewellyn. But anyway. Um, I, and I know more about sewer pipes than I wish I did, but uh, <laughs> we'll save that. Uh, as anyone who's been around Milwaukee uh, in the last few years during July 4th, despite the city's efforts to ban uh, fireworks, it does sound like people still have boxes of dynamite uh, just sitting around because they just light them off. Um, so 1903 is when the city started. That's when uh, they, uh, we had our first... Uh, I have not been able to track down the exact date, but sometime between February 5th, when the legislature signed off on the city being incorporated and June 2nd, somewhere in there, there was an election. Somewhere in there, they decided that May 21st was incorporation day for the city of Milwaukee. And so on our city seal, May 21st is our incorporation day. Today, uh, kind of starting in the 80s, today, we celebrate May 21st as Dogwood Day. And it's one of the great things that my office and that I get to work with, with Greg at the Historical Society and our partners at the Daughters of the American Revolution is to celebrate Dogwood Day. And I'll talk about the Dogwood here in just a minute. So we became a city in 1903, started getting things done, started having elections, starting having uh, a city council. Uh, within that first few years, the first city hall was rented space uh, at Jefferson and Main Street. I don't remember, Greg, correct me if you remember, I don't remember if it was the cha-cha-cha building or just on that corner uh, thereabouts, but it was the Woodman of the World, Wood, Woodsman of the World building. You remember, was that the same one? Uh, I always call it the Wonderland building, but I'm not really quite sure. Where Wonderland was. I, I'm, I'm remembering now it was the Woodsman of the World building and it was just rented space. It was our first city hall. Uh, fast forward uh, a decade and uh, you start, well, and at the end of in 1906, we uh, had our our first fire department was organized. It was a Milwaukee volunteer fire department. Uh, and then in 1917, uh, the Milwaukee Police Department was founded. Before that, we had an elected marshal uh, who um, I think Greg mentioned it, but the story goes at the very first city council meeting, there wasn't enough money for him to buy a gun. So he was asked, so the person who was elected, Jesse Keck, who's also an interesting character, did many things in his life, but um, he was asked to furnish his own gun and badge, which he did. <laughs> uh, so we, we operated with an elected marshal in order to enforce the law and being the bouncer at local nightclubs. Uh, but by 1917, Milwaukee said, you know what? It's time, it's time we have an uh, organized police department. They uh, hired, uh, and, and you hear our fire, I don't know if you can hear that, but there goes the predecessors of the Milwaukee Fire Department now, Clackamas Fire going somewhere. Um, How did you get that to happen right then? Uh, magic, sitting at City Hall. <laughs> uh, so we had the first police department was founded in 1917. They it included the chief and two officers. Uh, fast forward a couple more years in 1924. Uh, well, let's see, Oregon, Oregon uh, passed women's suffrage before the nation. 
the nation was in 1919, right? Everyone correct me, that's right, 1919, August, August 1919. Oregon had it, I believe, in 1912. Um, so women were allowed to vote and run for office. And in 1924, Elizabeth Hazen, the woman pictured there, uh, was elected uh, to the Milwaukee City Council and uh, was the first uh, woman elected um, to that body. Uh, I'm not totally clear of the details, but within a couple of years, her, Ms. Councillor Hazen and a couple of her colleagues were the subject of a recall election, and I think they were successfully recalled. I do not know what the issue was at the time, but uh, yeah. Were you going to say something, Stefan? No, I'm just fascinated by right. that. All right, okay. Uh, so Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hazen was elected in 1924. Uh, in the 1910s, the second city hall was built about 1911, 1912, and it was a building that actually operated and looked a lot like the current building, except it was just a box with the bottom floor having the fire station and the top floor having city hall. It was located, so it was the first intentionally built city government building in Milwaukee, and it was located at the corner of what is now 21st in Monroe on the property that is the Portland Waldorf School. It doesn't exist anymore. It was torn down um, because by the 1930s, um, in a very quick nutshell, the current city hall was the site of uh, Milwaukee's first school buildings. It was on the donation land claim, uh, claimed by Seth Llewellyn, Llewellyn, I think. And uh, he gave the property, it was a one then two room schoolhouse. By the 1990s, they built this really tall four or five story wooden ornate building that housed Milwaukee uh, kindergarten through high school. Well, uh, they built Milwaukee Elementary School on 27th Avenue in 1916. They built uh, Milwaukee High School, where it is now, the one that was just replaced in 1925. And then in the 1930s, they got, they, the school district got um, uh, federal money, federal New Deal money to build what is like, like grade said, Milwaukee Junior High, which is now Portland Waldorf. So they were done, the school district was done with this site at the time and the city wanted to build a new city hall, so they swapped. So uh, the corner that is now part of the Portland Waldorf building became a part of the school district property and uh, the city took over the current lot. I'll talk a little bit more about the home feature of this in a bit, but we purposely built this current city hall that, that Dan and I are sitting in right now uh, in 1937, 38. We purchased from the school district. It in included, and this is where it's important for the focus of the Leadership Academy, because it, it included all aspects of city government from the administration, from the city recorder, from the city man, well, future city managers. We, were, we didn't have a city manager in 1938. But the city council finance uh, it had the fire department, it had the police department, and there's a, a picture of it there in the 19. That's probably the, maybe the early 50s or late, probably the early 50s based on that car there. But city hall built uh, included everything, and it was a one-stop shop. Next slide, Dan. Um, on that, I do want to uh, note Rebecca's comment: U.S. Oh. women's suffrage was ratified by Congress in 1920, voted on by the states in 1919. There you so go. thank you, Rebecca. Thanks. I knew in the last year or two, we had just celebrated the centennial of that. So yes, thank you, for, thank you, Rebecca. And so pretty soon after that, uh, Milwaukee elected its first woman to city council. Uh, so in the 30s, we built our first city hall. Other things were starting to happen. This is uh, the late depression run up to World War II. And as Greg mentioned, and, and I totally agree, that's really when Milwaukee takes off in terms of population and starts developing. It's, it's not unique to Milwaukee. That's when suburbia across our country came into being when people had cars and ways and, and improved highways to get to big urban centers and live in the suburbs. Milwaukee directly benefited from that trend. Um, a part of that was the, uh, the McLaughlin Superhighway, which we know today as McLaughlin Boulevard. It was originally a US, uh, US 99E a highway. It is today a state, a state Oregon 99E, um, but that was put in and it replaced um, what was then called Front Avenue in downtown Milwaukee went the same uh, strip of land that McLaughlin does. That was a big deal. Uh, down McLaughlin, at least the part that came through downtown Milwaukee, uh, you, there's an image there at the top of where the, the inner urban trolleys still, still in the 30s, still running, still a very big reason for people to be able to live in Milwaukee and work elsewhere is because the trolleys were still actively used. Uh, with World War II came the need uh, to produce, mass produce all kinds of things from weaponry to aircrafts, and particularly uh, in places like Portland where there was a port, the Kaiser Shipyards, Henry Kaiser Shipyards in, up in Portland and Swan Island, 
required a lot of manpower. And the Portland metropolitan area saw a big influx of folks from the South and from the East and the Midwest coming here uh, to work in the shipyards. A lot of those folks ended up staying. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our families, your histories might be part of that. That touched the walk. There was a big, the biggest housing development in the Portland area was Vanport, which you might be familiar with up on the Columbia River. There was a similarly styled, uh, but much smaller uh, development here in Milwaukee called the Kellogg Park Housing Development. And if you're familiar with downtown Milwaukee, if you go up Main Street past Pietro's and you keep going up underneath the underpass, you come to Hannah Harvester Drive. And that very, that area generally, it, there's other buildings there now, but that's where this housing development was. And I think there's a cursor there, Dan, if that's uh, your cursor, that you could circle the area. That's the, that's a rendering of the housing that was there. It was government issues, uh, very basic uh, housing. And those, most, much of those housing after the war were moved across the tracks to uh, what is now known as Hillside Park and Manor. It's a Clackamas County Housing Authority uh, property across the street from across 32nd Avenue from Providence, Milwaukee. And so the, the, that housing development was originally the other side of the, the train tracks and it was government era housing, government built housing for World War II production. Uh, it was not meant to last 80 plus years as it has. <laughs> and so interestingly, just last night, the city council approved uh, the planned development for redeveloping uh, Hillside, the, the park part of it. Those buildings that have been there since World War II, they're finally gonna be replaced. Uh, and the housing authority using money passed by Metro a couple of years ago is doing that, that project. So the housing authority, that was a big deal. And um, like I mentioned at the top, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't without controversy. Uh, frankly, there were folks in our very white city of Milwaukee who were very concerned about people who did not make very much money coming to, to living in Milwaukee. And uh, I don't know the whole story, but I know that there was concern expressed uh, and some opposition was raised to, uh, to the development coming to town. It did come to town and then obviously moved across uh, the tracks when uh, companies like Hannah Harvester who made tractors and whatnot wanted that land for, for their business needs. But anyway, uh, the housing development came that was a big, uh, has had a, a big impact on Milwaukee. Uh, something that's super, super wonky, but if you wanna mark the, the start of the modern era of Milwaukee of, of government in Milwaukee marked the 1944 November election because that's when the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee voters adopted the current form of government. I think you covered this with Dan last time, if I'm, so I won't go into it. We have a council manager form of government. We have a, uh, an appointed city manager and five, a five member elected city council. That came to being in 1944 and several positions, the recorder, uh, justice of the peace, and uh, town marshal went from being elected positions to appointed. Um, so 1944 is a watershed moment for government. We hired our first city manager after that. It also established the municipal court as its own department and it continues uh, to this day. Another highlight of the forties, we bought our first car, at least for use by law enforcement, Milwaukee Police Department bought a Chevy. That will feature here in a story real quick, uh, an unfortunately sad story. And then, uh, by the 1950s, um, the city hall we had built just 12 years earlier in 1938 was too small. So the city started to say, we're, we're too small. We, we need to grow our footprint. Also, our city is growing east past, uh, you know, past what is now we call historic Milwaukee, past the railroad. It's going up Minthorn Hill. It's going, it's going that way. We need to start expanding. So they purchased property at 40th and Harvey, which if you're familiar with that, it's where Water Tower Park is. And then adjacent to that, if this is up in the Ardenwald neighborhood, and adjacent to that, there's some government structures there, and we have a well tower there. And there's a fairly, if you're interested in mid-century architecture, there's a fire station there, an old fire station, not, not in use uh, on that property. The city acquired that property in the 40s. It originally housed public works. At the time, the city had its own parks department, and there was a fire station. Also of note, in the 1950s, on a sad note, uh, are two and today only uh, fatalities in the line of duty. As uh, Greg mentioned, Fireman Warren Knott uh, was called down to Kellogg Creek um, uh, Lake uh, in February of 1953, I believe, because a father and son had fallen in the ice and in the water. He managed to save them, but in the process, he himself drowned. So that's unfortunate. Uh, 
19, maybe I'm thinking more than that might have been like 54, 55, because in the, on New Year's Eve 1953 was our one and only police officer uh, in the line of duty death. Uh, Sergeant Worrell was on duty on New Year's Eve. He was in that 1947 Chevy parked in front of City Hall. And um, it, it's not clear, but he, he did uh, die from intoxication from, they believe the tailpipe of his car froze over and the noxious fumes went into the car. He might have fallen asleep and didn't realize what was happening. And unfortunately, he passed away. So uh, those are some sad moments in our city's history. Uh, to, to this point, the only time that uh, Milwaukee Fire or Milwaukee have experienced the death of uh, one of our active members. Uh, the 50s ended with uh, an era of increased growth. I'm looking at Wikipedia because it's not ever wrong, right? In 1950, the population of Milwaukee was 5,253. By 1960, it was 9,000. So that's, you know, if you're familiar with the growth of the 50s, like I said, suburbia, Milwaukee bloomed for sure. Another sad note in the 50s is we lost the trolley trail. Or we lost the trolley uh, in urban line. And contrary to what you might assume based on how light rail was fought tooth and nail by much of Clackamas County when it came back in 2015, there were, there were many residents in Clackamas County who fought tooth and nail in 1958 to keep the interurban going because they were using it to commute to jobs in Portland. Uh, the reality was this was the days before TriMet. There were uh, semi-private or pretty much private train companies running our local train lines. I think this last iteration of it was called the Portland Traction Company, which as an organization still exists in a different form. It's what runs the, the train that goes to um, OMSI, that up and down. Uh, they, ran, they said they couldn't do it anymore. They ran out of money and they closed the line. So sadly, we lost uh, uh, pre the precursor to light rail in 1958. Next slide, Dan. And I know it's, I see the time and I'm gonna try to keep going. So other things happened and this is how it goes. I just ramble, I apologize. Um, 1962 uh, culminates in a decade long effort to um, get city, the city to adopt a, uh, a nickname. In the early uh, part of the 20th century, people like the wife of Mayor Schindler started planting or noticing that the Pacific dogwood, which is a native species to the West Coast, grew pretty well in Milwaukee. And so they started cultivating this. And by 1952, uh, the world's largest, tallest and roundest dogwood tree existed right here in Milwaukee, Oregon. It existed on the property of Mayor and Mrs. William Schindler, which the house, that house still stands. It's across the street from the public safety building at 32nd and near Harrison Street. And descendants of the Schindlers, I believe, still own that house. The tree, unfortunately, um, made it to 1962, made it to the city council, passing a resolution making this the Dogwood City of the West and adopting what the first of several Dogwood iterations. But the Columbus Day Store of 1962 damaged it. And by the end of that decade, it had to be taken down because it got diseased. So that's sad for that original story. But we are the Dogwood City of the West and we have officially been since 1962. The 1960s uh, also saw some other milestones in, in local government. Uh, Florence Letting, um, who was a pioneering woman in her own right, and that she was the second woman in the state of Oregon to be admitted to the Oregon State Bar to be an attorney, and was the first U.S. bankruptcy court judge, right, Greg, uh, in the state of Oregon. So she was a pioneering woman. She was married to an attorney, Herman Letting. Uh, in 1961, Miss Florence Letting, who was related, uh, was the stepdaughter of Seth Llewellyn one of the town's uh, pioneer era founders. Um, Ms. Florence passed away in 1961. Her estate left her home and her library to the city to be the genesis of a public library in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, if you visited our library before 2019, you would be familiar with how that library looked, which was basically the nucleus of that building was, Ms., was, was Florence's house. And there had been a couple of, there was a 60s wing and an 80s wing to that, but it was essentially Florence's house. Uh, and so Milwaukee's library has a history I won't go into right now, but uh, it started as its own building, which was across the street here from where I am at 21st and uh, Harrison in the 1960s. By 1964, the Letting Library of Milwaukee was open. Uh, mid, um, mid 1960s, the city adopted its first million dollar budget, which was a huge, huge controversy. I can't get too much into it, but it led to a mayor being elected over the million dollar budget, I think opposed to it. 
not wanting wanting the people wanting the people to vote on a million dollar budget, and he ended up resigning within a year. And there were many votes, many referendums on it. Eventually, a million dollar budget was approved, and then later changed the rules so that the people didn't have to be asked to vote on a million dollar budget because it was such a controversy. And also, Highway 224 was uh, a state highway was put in, largely mirroring the railroad that cuts to the middle of Milwaukee. Um, that came to be, and it was also super controversial because if you think about how much the 224 and the Union Pacific Railroad slices our city into two halves, that's exactly where they were afraid of. And in a lot of ways, unfortunately, that is exactly what has happened. It's really hard to walk and ride and bike across that. And the city's working on that, but that, that came in the 60s too. But think of the spread of suburbia in the 60s and the highway like 224 makes a lot of sense in that thinking. So fast forward uh, real quick to the 1980s and a really fascinating thing happened that I'll try to use this as one of the things I'll wrap up on because I'm sure in talking to my colleagues over the next few months, you'll hear about some of the other things we're working on. But in the 1980s, there was this movement to merge Milwaukee and much of what was unincorporated Northern Clackamas County into a city. That would have probably included much of what is today Happy Valley and much of what is Oak Grove and Jennings Lodge in the Clackamas area uh, would have been one giant city. And at that time, it would have been Oregon's fourth largest city. It got enough support to get on the ballot in, 19, in 1981, I believe it was 81, uh, and it failed spectacularly. It was a super interesting concept. My read of it, and perhaps others who, who might have been around at the time know more, but my read of it was it, it just seemed to make a lot of sense. And it's actually probably a lot of the sense that our, our neighbors in Oak Grove and Jennings Lodge are talking about right now. If you don't know about the Oak Grove Governance Project, I think it's that Oak Lodge Governance Project, is that its name, right? Somebody? Yeah, uh, look them up online. They're, they're looking at becoming what it would take for them to become a city. Um, anyway, there was this idea, failed horribly in 1981, even in the city, outside the city, it was like a six to one margin. People thought that was a terrible idea. And there's this really awesome, if you're into political uh, cartoons, there's an image right there and I can share with you, if, you, if you're interested, I can share a bigger version of it. Um, but the anti-consolidation forces compared becoming a major city uh, to communism. And the squid thing there is eating all the other little com communities. Uh, the ones listed here, like there's Oak Lodge and I think Concord's listed in Overland Park, which I think is a name given to the folks east of our border between our border, like between Linwood and 82nd, that's kind of Overland. So, it's a fascinating political cartoon and it was, it, we would have been communists basically uh, what this cartoon suggests if we had become a major city. There would have been other benefits to that, but uh, it didn't happen. And I submit that uh, much of the regionalization that you see coming after uh, in the eighties and the nineties is in some way, um, the people who thought it was a good idea to be a city said, okay, well, that's not gonna work. What else can we do to consolidate government to be more efficient as a region, to be a North Clackamas County regional thing? And it's in the late 80s, early 90s that you get the formation of the North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District. You get Clackamas Fire growing from a, a rural fire district, the rural fire district just east of Milwaukee, actually the one that, the district that would have been from our city boundary, basically where I-205 is. They merged with Milwaukee Fire in 1996 and now Clackamas Fire if you follow that, that, it has moved, it has absorbed all the way out to almost Sandy. It almost absorbed Estacada before the fires last year, but it was going that way. All of Oregon City uh, is part of Clackamas Fire. It's the second largest fire district in the state of Oregon. And it started right here in North Clackamas County with Milwaukee. Um, so much of the 80s and 90s in terms of government here is uh, about the regionalization. Like Greg mentioned, the rise of Metro going from just being the boundary, the property line dispute, folks to running a zoo and golf courses and transportation and now collecting money uh, and supporting public housing or supporting affordable housing. So that's much of the story there. I glossed over a lot of it because I see the time and I'm trying to be good for Dan because if Dan has to yank his supervisor off, that probably wouldn't be good. Some other things happen, <laughs> like our first female uh, city manager came in 2010 on an interim basis. Uh, my predecessor, Pat Duvall, was a city reporter and we're out of time. Again, Dan, I'm sorry. I told you I wouldn't do it, but I did it. Did we want to talk about any of the community opportunities at the very end there? I, I know that we do, and uh, I think we might be coming right down to time uh, as we as we tend to. I do want to say, and Greg 
one of these years we are going to get an opportunity to hear about places that people can be involved in the community. Uh, that all being said, not only do not not until we extend the meeting past uh, nine o'clock. I started I'll tell you what, man. I am trying. Greg <laughs> <laughs> did better this year. I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, it's you know what we're we're all it's by third third year's the charm, no doubt. Who's who's got uh, who's got questions? Who's got who's got stuff? I want to I want to play my part as a color commentator here and add a couple things to Scott's comments. One was uh, about the trolley routes. Uh, the focus has been on the main one through Milwaukee, north and south. But if you look at the Springwater Corridor, that was another one. Uh, and uh, they, they were all over the region. And uh, my father-in-law talks often about riding the, you know, riding the trolley from Portland, Oregon City, or Gresham, or wherever the heck he was going. Uh, kind, of, kind of amazing that it all went away in 58. But the trolley trail is a really good hike. Uh, and it's still out there. You can start at Milwaukee Bay Park and head south. Uh, it's a pr pretty nice walk. Um, Scott talked about the effect of the storms in 1962 and 64. And what we can say safely is none of us here, have, who, if you weren't here in 62, you ain't ever seen anything like that. Because it was a for real hurricane on Columbus Day in 1962. Blew, blew windows out of thousands of houses and roofs off houses. And uh, just we just don't see things like that, I'm glad to say. Uh, the 64 storms left flooding all over the Northwest. The 96 flood um, still is a, the thing for which flood levels are calibrated for zoning uh, and will be for some years until the next big storm like that. But anyway, I just wanted to point those things out. Fantastic. Thanks, Stefan, for that, uh, for that perspective. And thanks also to uh, Scott and Greg uh we do have just a couple of more minutes if if uh, nobody else has any uh any questions for the presenters uh greg would you would you like to do a very very abbreviated version of your of your section or do we want to uh how, how do you want to play it an an odd man if i had a question Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just wondering how the name Milwaukee came about, especially the spelling. Well, uh, that is one we know we can directly credit to Lot Whitcomb. He, when, on his way from Vermont to the West Coast, he went through the town of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which was actually only settled in the early 1840s in term, uh, by, by white European Americans. And they named it after Milwaukee. Uh, it was, it's derived from a Potawatomi Indian word uh, that means uh, land near the waters or council meeting place, some council meeting place or a special place by the waters. He thought that was a cool name. And so when he came to settle a community in Oregon, he named it after that. There was a bit of a back, bit of a back and forth because we spell it, you know, M-I-L-W-A-U-K-I-E and Wisconsin spells it K-E-E. -E. And actually for most of the 19th century, the communities both spelt it both ways because in the 19th century, Nobody really cared that much about uh, being consistent. Uh, and there's actually a story that in Wisconsin, it depended if the Democrats were in charge, then they spelt it Milwaukee K-I-E. And if the Republicans, the Whigs, and then later the Republicans were in charge, they spelt it K-E-E. -E. <laughs> By the 20th century, it had been decided that that Wisconsin was K-E-E, -E, and this, this uh, that Milwaukee was K-E-E, -E, and this Milwaukee was K-I-E. Some people blame the post office, but a lot would come pick the name. The post office settled the debate in the long run. They they told us how we were going to spell it. Yeah. And yet they still continue to include our neighbors uh, to the south in Milwaukee, although they're not in Milwaukee. Uh, and and uh, that doesn't mean that we're not certainly glad to have you folks in the Milwaukee community. Uh, Dave, you've got a question. I think you might be muted. Yeah, this is um, has nothing to do with what you guys have just told me. I just wanted to know how I can go about getting answers to questions that are related to <clears throat> stuff within town, but not necessarily <clears throat> about the history. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Sure. Um, so a couple of options. That, that's a that's a great general purpose question. A uh, couple of different ways that you can do that. Uh, there is the uh, uh, um, comment form on the city's website where you can uh, write in and you can uh, you can you can uh, reach out to us that way. Uh, there's also the city manager's phone number, which I answer and I should know it, but I don't off the top of my head. So I'm pulling that up as I type. <laughs> Uh, and that's going to be... By the way, it goes to message machine all the time. It does, yeah. But that message machine goes directly to my email and I call folks back. Don't be surprised if you get a call back within about 10 minutes or sometimes a little longer, but mostly pretty quick. Uh, and that uh, that phone number is 503-786-7518. Again, 503-786-7518. Or again, by going to the city website, milwaukeeoregon.gov under useful links, click on contact the city. And uh, sure enough, that also comes across my desk, uh, but we will get it, uh, get it routed to the appropriate department. Or for those of you in the class, by all means, just reach out to me directly at my email. You have it. Uh, and we'll get that get that to you. Throughout the course of this class, we will be meeting folks from most, if not all, of the city departments. So if you have questions that are less pressing, you can reach out or you can um, hold on for them and you can ask them yourself in person. Dan, can I make a quick plug for something real quick? Please. One of the things I was supposed to talk about was boards and committees, <clears throat> because one of my roles at the city is I, I, I'm not the staff liaison to these committees. We have 14 of them. 14 of my colleagues actually are the liaisons to those committees, but we have 14 boards and committees. I encourage you to go, like Dan said, milwaukeeoregon.gov slash BC, really easy URL, milwaukeeoregon.gov slash BC. All 14 are listed there. You can learn about them. We have several vacancies if you're interested in applying. Um, the Milwaukee Leadership Academy is now, what is this, its third run, Stefan and Dan's third year. And it's already building a reputation for being a springboard for a lot of folks to get involved in our boards and committees, which is amazing. Um, so I encourage you, to, I was supposed to have gotten there. I talked too much. Go to milwaukeeoregon.gov slash BC. There is a change coming at the end of this year, beginning of next year, and how we do our recruitment. We're going to do uh, uh, an annual recruitment process. Uh, so be looking, if you get the pilot, watch there uh, or look for that at that BC page. We're going to have some updates. If you're interested in any of the committees, we're going to ask you to apply real soon, and it's just going to be a once a year kind of a window. So anyway, I didn't get to it in my talk. I'm sorry, but check out our 14 boards and committees. They do some amazing work, and they're really incredible um, volunteer opportunities. All right. If you since you get to plug the city's boards and committees, I want to plug uh, uh, neighborhood district associations. If you live in Milwaukee or work in Milwaukee, you are in. Uh, and NDA and uh, find out about it. Find out what they're doing, attend a meeting. They're, uh, you know, they're all on Zoom right now, but I think that's gonna change before too long. Um, I've been an active member in the Llewellyn Neighborhood Association. I've chaired that group in the past and uh, they do a lot of good work. And, uh, and sometimes uh, just a handful of people turning out and uh, getting involved can make a difference in those neighborhoods. If Stefan gets to plug uh, the <laughs> NDAs and Scott uh, gets to plug the boards and commissions, which I, I regularly attend my NDA and I've been on boards and commissions for the last 15 years here in the city, <clears throat> your local organizations as well. They do a lot of hard work. Um, the Milwaukee Museum's one, Milwaukee Environmental Stewards Group is one, Milwaukee Rotary is one, Laundry Love, um, there are 101 different organizations uh, that work throughout Milwaukee that do a lot of hard work. Find something that you're passionate about and, um, you know, just send them an email, check out the website, like their page on Facebook, show up at an event. You will be welcome uh, and you will find yourself with a partnership of people that, uh, that share your same passion and that can help you lead into other avenues to working with the city as well. Good all right, time. if those gentlemen get to plug all their things, then I'm going to go ahead and throw one out right now for Milwaukee CERT, uh, which is the uh, Community Emergency Response Team. They're going to be working with us, uh, helping with uh, some traffic flow here at the Umbrella Parade and Tree Lighting, December 4th, downtown. Go ahead and check that out on the community calendar. And also the Milwaukee Parks Foundation. Uh, 
because we are going to have uh, even more and better and more impressive parks in the years to come, and they're doing great work. Uh, also, why not, as long as we're on it, celebrate Milwaukee Inc. and the great work that they do through the Milwaukee Farmers Market, keeping our downtown active and humming on Sundays, May through October. All right, now, but it is it is aha moment time, Stefan, so I'm going to be quiet. And I'm going to turn it over to the group. Who heard something tonight that surprised them or really something that will really stay with you? Not a thing. Come on, I thought that the whole dynamite thing was a, was a hot item. Yeah. That was a hot item, I got to admit. The thing that really disappoints me about Milwaukee um, was the, the loss of the trains because all over the United States, they had tracks going everywhere. And I lived in Northern California and they had train lines initially set up to haul lumber but they started hauling people and they bring them to the beaches and the weirdest little oddball places. And little by little, they pulled up the tracks. Now the light rail is nice, <clears throat> but the trolley's got a lot more pizzazz. I mean, it's just, I went and took a ride on the Os Lake Oswego trolley and it was cool. I mean, it wasn't a real one. It was a, a reproduction, but it was a reproduction of what they used to have here. It was a fun ride and um, it's just kind of sad, but uh now, the dynamite thing was cool. I'm glad that I learned that little factoid. Makes a lot of sense once you know it. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Kevin's got in the chat the uh, origin of the Letting Library, and it looks like from Rebecca, happy to hear that one of the Japanese American matriarchs is still living and active in Milwaukee. Hooray for neighborliness. Hooray for neighborly neighborliness indeed. Anybody else? So I didn't realize, and I probably heard it before, Greg or Scott, but tonight it really sunk in that uh, Florence Letting was the second woman admitted to Oregon's bar to practice law. My grandmother was the second woman admitted to the bar in the state of Indiana. <laughs> you, you don't look that old, Stefan. Uh, 114, <laughs> spry as can be. There it is. I think that's almost the time. We got time for one more aha. If anybody oh. has one, love to hear it. What are we doing next month then? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, going once, <laughs> going twice. Oh, you got right, one. So, oh, there you go. Go for it. I just was surprised when I did the reading and to hear again tonight uh, about the Native Americans getting wiped out by disease. And I mentioned it uh, to my husband and he heard that in Washington, so many more cities and places are named after various tribes because so many more of them survived when there was, uh, when settlements came to the Pacific Northwest, but not in Oregon. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know for sure, but I would hesitate to, I would venture to guess probably because Oregon became a US state 30 years quicker than the state of than Washington did. And there was a heavier influence of the British Empire up north for a lot longer. <clears throat> so I, I've, I've observed that too. Seattle, uh, Tacoma, you know, those are yeah. native place names. People yeah. names. Yep. Uh, so next month, next month right here in the Milwaukee Leadership Academy, we're going to be hearing from Bonnie Dennis, who is our finance director. And so we're going to be hearing about uh, city budgets and, and where that money comes from and where it goes. Um, I also have some feelers out. Uh, we were originally, I was originally slated to have uh, Public Works come and visit with us, uh, but that's going to be a scheduling conflict for them. So I'm hoping that we're able to get uh, John Hennington, who is our equity program manager. Um, but I was a little bit late reaching out to John. So that's on me. I don't actually have an answer back from him yet. Uh, but my hope is, is that we'll hear about finance and our equity program uh, in December. And a uh, very special guest appearance, it very much looks like, from uh, my very own brand new baby son. So something to look forward to there. <laughs> uh, with that, I think that's everything. We're at 801. Stefan, anything before we go? No, thanks again. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to Scott and Greg. Uh, and thanks, thanks everyone for taking the time. We'll, uh, I'll be in touch with you before the end of the week with uh, some more links and some more information. Uh, and beyond that, I guess just have a... Uh, have a warm and safe November, December. We'll see you back next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.